Well, hello everybody, this is Dr. Charles C. Lucas, the very proud senior pastor of Promise Land Ministries. Welcome to the broadcast of the Promise Land Ministries Network. And before we get started, guess what? This is the announcement. Yeah, I'm doing them. So check this out now. Share and subscribe before we get started. Share and subscribe, amen. Don't be stingy with the word of God. Hey, YouTube Brit, YouTube Prophet Campbell. Yeah, come on, Dougie Doug. Come on now, uh, KFU at Bedside Baptist. Don't front me, right? And so share and subscribe the word of God, amen. Guess what, T Tasha, Tasha Lucas has been bringing in some stuff. Come on, y'all, let's go, fam. Share and subscribe. Be proud of your ministry, amen, amen. And guess what, the pastor don't, the pastor don't, uh, 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 don't, don't get embarrassed you and I got to bail you out of jail. So hey, guess what now? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead, don't, don't do that now, right? So share and subscribe, give, right? Give, good, give the fine give, amen. You know, good, well, I'm just going to put this money in my pocket. Guess what now? That stuff goes to revivals. It goes to the facilities. It goes to media. It goes to things that you're enjoying that God is blessing in your life, amen. So guess what? We have a tool right now called Givelify. G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y. And guess what? You're going to go to the Google Store. You're going to go to the Apple Store. And you can get it on your Android or your iPhone. Amen. And when you do that, then do a search for Promise and Ministries Incorporated. And guess what? Peace Street Corners, Georgia. Make sure you put Incorporated in the back of it. Promise and Ministries Incorporated in Peace Street Corners, Georgia. And give. Worship the Lord with your giving. Amen. And guess what? He watches that and he'll bless it. You're being faithful over what God God is giving you. Okay, next, volunteer. We've got revivals that are going to be coming up in the pipeline. We've always got that. Amen. Volunteer. Volunteer for the parking lot ministry. Volunteer for ushers. Volunteer. Amen. And guess what? God will bless you. Not just give of your substance, but give of the wealth of time that you have. Amen. Even the intercessory team that we are, that we have. Guess what now? You be working with Prophet Campbell. And guess what now? Um, give, I mean, uh, give your time and volunteer. If all you can do is pray for someone and you're immobile in your home, guess what? We have a place for you. Amen. Next, Wednesday night Bible study. Yay. And guess what? Now that's 7 p.m. Eastern time on our broadcast. Amen. Come in and get the word of God. You need more than one feeding of the word weekly. Amen. And guess what? We got you. And the Holy Spirit's going to speak to your needs. Holy Spirit's going to speak to your desires. Holy Spirit's going to speak what the Father wants you to do to get you back on track and keep you on track. For I know one thing. I know Promise and Ministries is anointed by God to do his work and to enrich your life. Amen. The Boaz Institute, we are on class, what, six now, cuz, and guess what now? We got ladies in. This is the first all-girl, all-woman class, and guess what? They are killing it. Amen. So just keep going. Keep your study. And then guess what? Other Boaz team, guess what? Keep working with the tutor. Keep Keep, keep moving. There you go. I like that. Come on now. Keep moving. Amen. Keep moving. This is a game changer for your life. So I need you to stay encouraged in it. Right? Stay encouraged because if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Amen. Guess what? Pray about it before you go. That's what I do before I go to the gym. Pray about, pray over um, your classes. Pray over your study session. Pray over your job interviews. Pray that God anoints your mind. I pray for you daily, but guess what? Come in agreement with the prayer that your pastor's praying over you. Uh, men and women of Boaz now. Amen. And guess what? Welcome new members. Hey, we got, you know, we got some new members. Oh, Tasha came through. We got new members now. So welcome. This is your pastor. And I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna be with you to, 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 to marry you and bury you. Amen. And so that's what we do. We're hands-on ministry. And welcome here. You're here to receive the word of God. And guess what? This ministry will not disappoint. And guess what now? We say welcome home. And guess what your pastor say? Keep moving. Well, hey, everybody. This is Dr. Charles C. Lucas. I am very proud and excited. Senior Pastor of Promise and Ministry. Welcome to another broadcast of the Promise and Ministry. Network. Hello, Addison. How are you? I see you, baby. I see you. I saw those hash browns, too. I eat some, too. And so I have with me a good friend of mine, our overseer, uh, Apostle Ron J. Please say hello, Apostle. Super excited to be here, and welcome to another You Made the Bible Study. I'm so proud. Look at how cute you are. 
And so, guess what now? Hey, uh, remember what we do? Share and subscribe, right? Share and subscribe to the broadcast. And so, we have been going through some very intimate topics here. And so, share and subscribe to the broadcast so other people can uh, um, be blessed just like you are. And then also, guess what now? Give, continue to give to the ministry. You know, we have the outdoor Bibles. We have the, the facility that we, that, we, that we take care of. And so, guess what? Your ministry... Your ministry goes directly to that. And then you have an application called what? Give a buy. And that is on um, 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 the Google Play or the Google Store and also the um, um, Apple Store. So you can download that and then guess what? Do a search just like the announcement said. Do a search on your uh, Promisand Ministries Incorporated. Um, Promisand Ministries Incorporated in Peachtree Corners, Georgia. Amen. And so guess what? Now we're excited. We're going to get right into the Word of God. We're excited. And guess what? You see where we are. We're at my home here. And so we are having an intimate uh, setting regarding because we're talking about Father, what your Father should have told you. And then also I want to give you a warm introduction as as uh, Apostle James is going to be uh, ministering to you for the month of December. Yes, right. Pastor's going on vacation. He's going surfing. And so guess what? I, I'm so proud that we you are in good hands, extremely good hands. He's got over two decades of ministry experience. And, and so he oversees other churches over there in Iowa. So you are in good hands. Amen. So anything you want to say before we get started, Apostle? Just excited to be here and support to really get to know everyone. I encourage those of you who are here tonight to continue to watch it. I believe that there's going to be some significant things that we talk about these next few weeks. As Pastor God, for the sabbatical, which every pastor needs. Take a break from time to time. That's right. You got to work me out or something. Brent, I know you got you. Brent, I know all of the, um, Prophet, Prophet Campbell, Doug, you know, Kevin, uh, Deandre, Deandre, you know, Kill, all you guys, you guys have, you know, from San Nation, you got uh, Apostle James back. And so we're just going to do a mixture of, of in the facility and also from his, uh, uh, his private study. He's going to be doing some. Bible study and then doing um, ministry from the auditorium. So you are in good hands, amen. So guess what? You want to pray and then get started with the word of God. Amen. You ready? No. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord God. Lord, forgive us for, for any and every sin that we commit, Lord God. And you said, if we confess our sin, your faith and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord God. Father, we look to you, Lord God. Father God, we ask you, Lord God, to help us. Cleanse our heart from the cares of the day, Lord God, and the distraction of the day. And Father God, we are here to break bread with you. We're here to receive you. Holy Spirit, you are the star of the show. We just ask you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us like only you can. Correct, encourage, strengthen, and confirm. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, before we get started, y'all already know, because we are the top biblical literature. So guess what? Have your Bible, boom. Have your notepad, boom. Have your ink pen, boom. And have your highlighter, amen. And so we get into study. And guess what now, uh, Apostle? And Apostle James, we just let him know that we're going to have to have a discussion, maybe an interview, Apostle James, regarding uh, fatherhood, godly fatherhood. And Apostle James, we talked about Sunday. Uh, we talked about how uh, we talked about watch your relationships and how to discern God or gain relationships. So if you can give us some input, I just want to interview you and kind of, and then you speak to us about from your, you know, you've been in a relationship with your wife for over 48 years. So tell us what, how would, how would we identify what a god ordained relationship is and how do we manage that? Well, it's important to understand the majority of our relationships are not our children. That's something we have to come to grips with. We, we don't choose to, we're born out of and choose that. We don't choose the children's birth. We, as a matter of fact, should not be on our own choosing the women that we're supposed to marry to. We have to be able to understand that God brings people into our lives. We have to recognize that those God-given things you need to do. For instance, there's often times when you, you have a relationship with people who do things that are contrary to the word of God, you begin to have certain attachments to them that God never intended to be. For sure, premarital sex is one of the problems. This society, premarital sex is rampant. But the issue is, 
we should not have premarital sex because when you do that, you, you, you develop a solo time with that person, and now it's difficult to break free. So what needs to happen is, you know, when we begin to have brothers, and you look at David, and you look at Saul's son, you look at David. David had a relationship with another man that was like brothers. They looked at each other, and God began to say, you know, you need to see that this young man is like a brother. Even though David has multiple brothers, he never had the same relationship that he had with Saul's son. So it was really interesting that those two began to develop a brother type situation when his natural brothers were not there for him. Even when he went to fight the lion, they were like, Look at you, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that. Same thing happened when it comes to Joseph. Joseph was in a situation where he was sold by his brothers, but he recognized that God had did something for him and took him out of that situation to put him in a place where he could save an entire generation. So oftentimes we have to look at what God is doing around us and not deal by emotion. One of the problems that we do have when it comes to relationship is we get our emotions involved first instead of allowing the spirit to move us first. So what happens is once our emotions get involved first, not all of a sudden we have emotional time and it's difficult to break it down now calling you know, in the situation. So thing again, I would suggest when you come to any kind of relationship, try to get your spiritual ears tuned first before you get your emotional uh, situations attached to your ears. How do we avoid those pitfalls that you talked about, the emotional piece that so easily gets us? Sometimes so we're lonely, sometimes we just, we, we want to, something you have you ever seen people want to believe it's God? <laughs> Well, I see a lot of it that people who want to see it done. Uh, and, and the thing has to happen is that we aspects. The Bible is clear uh, when Adam was in the garden, the God he had said, it is not good that man should be alone. So it's not a good situation for anybody in mankind to be alone. He made us to be able to work together and be with other people. But the problem is, is that we, we begin to pervert it. We begin to pervert it, saying this is what I want, this is who I want, and this is how I want it, versus saying, God, what do you want me to do? Because God is very clear. He says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God to give liberty to all men and the brave God, but ask in faith. So we have God situations to begin to deal with things spiritually is much easier. I mean, it's looking to me and my wife being together. You know, you need to understand that when we first met, it was a love issue. And what ended up happening, we were married for seven years, we ended up getting divorced. But then what we began to realize is even though we did do that, it was God who worked us together. We looked at how we actually met. We looked at the possibility of this happening. And we began to pray about it. She began to pray about it. I began to pray about it. We began to say, okay, we made a mistake uh, in the first place. We should have kept ourselves because we weren't saved. We got married. Then when we both got saved, we began to realize this is what God intended for us to do. So we began to uh, deal with the issues. We began to talk about all the things that would affect us emotionally. We began to deal with these things. Well, this I don't like that. Like that. And we began to realize we have to be together spiritually. So it's imperative as a people that we don't allow our emotions to cloud it because it will cloud. I mean, if you even if you look at the God of Eden with Adam. It, it, it didn't say that he said that it's Adam's. So now the enemy used he to get out to a place of saying, man, if I, if I do, if I don't do this, she's going to be gone. I want to stay with her. And the whole problem may have to be of that. So now that's another issue that we have to work on is recognizing that if you are like you can to the detriment of the relationship, do things that cause harm to the whole thing. So you gotta understand our relationships have to be ordained with God and it's not good enough problems. If if you're in a father's position and you how do you handle that if giving fatherly advice if you got adults, um, children, spiritual children that you know aren't ready to receive it? How do you man and you know they're going down the road in a relationship, you can see it. You can discern. 
How do you feel? Well, for sure, you can't not say it. For sure, if God is telling you to say something or do something, uh, if you've been around that person long enough, you should have an understanding like David and Nathan. Nathan knew how to talk to David. So he presented it to him in a way that he would understand. So if you have children or adult children or people who uh, are in your orbit or in your relationship, you need to first begin to understand and gain the trust before you can give advice. People don't really want advice even if, I mean, most teenagers don't want, and young adults don't necessarily want advice from their parents. Uh, most of them believe that they're more, how should I put it, well rounded, but this is what I tell myself all the time. So you may know more about Snapchat, Facebook, and that, but you don't know more about life. So I want you to listen to me because I have no reason to hold you back. But at the same time, I'm giving them the option to make decisions on their own. Because that's what you have to do. You can't you can't go over into manipulation and control. Because that's just like what you, so what you want to do. You want to share with them and then give them the option to choose. It's like Joshua said, choose you this day you're gonna serve. But this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna serve you. You choose what you want to do, but this is what I'm gonna do. So it's important that we know we give them advice, but we don't move over into manipulation and control. Because if we do that, it's the truth. How do you spiritually father um, a generation who might not have had a father at home? You might might have a father of male reports. Well, that's a real that's a that's a very interesting because this generation is probably the most fatherless in many generations. Single parent homes are pretty much the norm. And unfortunately, you can tell when there are young men and young women who are looking for someone in that position now. It is important that you understand the people who are called to you. Father is clear says, how can they heal without a preacher? And then the next verse says, how can they preach it except you've been sick? So you're not called a part of everybody, but you have to recognize those people who you can call to. Now you could write a book or you could, you could do a message and if other people hear it, fine. But once you begin to, to understand who, who Father God is, it's easier to understand Father and you. Because as we grow older, God begins to place certain things. I have I don't know if you know who Fred Hammond. I'm yes. not talking about singing. I'm talking about the guy who wrote Pigs in the Park. Now, this is what happened to me. I had been at a lot of conferences and I had a whole crowd. If you knew the person, I could tell you who he is. But anyway, we were at this conference and, and uh, if you know anything about Fred Hammond, what he did is he wrote Pigs in the Park and opened people's eyes up to deliverance. And they kind of called him the father of deliverance. He was one of the first people who began to really talk about it. So I'm at a conference and he's well into his 80s and uh, I don't believe it was by chance. We're sitting at the table with all these higher up people. And guess what happens? He is sitting right next to me. Now, I'm on his right hand. I'm like saying to myself, Okay. But then what he did, we were in the bill, we we're talking across the table. He said, you yeah, know, I want to, I believe the Lord told me to be surprised the rest of it. And even though my father was a good father, it 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 was a sign to me that he was telling me, I want you to be father. So after that point, I had to recognize look at the people who were coming around me, young men and young women, that wanted me to father them. And it, it wasn't like a, a natural thing because it was a natural thing. And I don't want to get into the spiritual father, spiritual mother. I think we do use that term too loosely. But you see, Paul only called two people. He called Titus and Timothy, his son. He didn't call anybody else. He didn't call the church he birth. He didn't call all of them. He just called Timothy and Titus. These two guys are my son ministry. 
So I began to recognize and see that there used to there would be people come around me. And I'd be saying, okay, you know, what is this about? And I asked God to show me am I supposed to follow them? Am I supposed to talk to them? And God would begin to show me different things and I begin to so it's not about emotion because there's a lot of people that I have desire for to see them be blessed. But even Jesus only prayed for one man. Even though he, he worked over the entire city, he only prayed for I see my father do. That's what I do. I don't do anything outside of what I see my father. So it's imperative that we recognize God will bring them. We have to respond as God will. So I, I, this question has been burning in my head. What can you give us some feed on how to tell the police if it's not? Well, first of all, you know, people should be the case. You know, it's important to allow people to say, well, you know, are they not saved? But just the doctors used to say, not saved. Even David had um, relationships with non Jews, non Hebrews. Even Solomon, his son, benefited from relationships that were not, um, um, how should I say, saved. He, had, he went to different places in different countries, even nations, and they blessed him with stuff so he could build the temple. So, first of all, it's not determined by whether a person is saved or not saved. It's determined by how God deals with you. So, for, for instance, um, oftentimes, relationships that are not ordained of God, it will cause you to get diverted. It will cause you to get off track. It will cause you to be diverted from what God wants you to do. Uh, Paul said the same thing when it came to to, to uh, Mark John Martin. He's like, he's not ready. He's not ready. And Barnabas insisted on him coming. And it called him to split the way. You didn't hear too much about Barnabas after that. But you see what Paul exploited all the writings he does because he did not allow himself to be on track dealing with situations that later on John Mark came back because he was ready. So you have to first look at if I'm being diverted, is my attention being drawn away from God what he wants me to do? Because it's real simple. If you ask God to show you things that make my path a plain path, make it a plain path because of my enemy. The enemy is always trying to distract us. But if you continue to pray, God will make your path a plain path. you will begin to show you different places, different situations, and people that you're supposed to be with, the people you're not supposed to be with. So it's imperative that we don't just say, oh, yeah, I, I left the job and I'm working next to this person I'm supposed to have a relationship with. No, that's not true. Or uh, this person is not saved, so I'm not supposed to have a relationship. That's not true either. you got to be able to say, okay, who is it? God show me. And, and first and foremost, we always have to bring things to God. Whatever it is, relation or bring it for the Lord. If it's the job, I will bring it. If it's the circumstance, I'll bring it. And as you mature, God will begin to make it very clear, very plain, the people you're supposed to be with and the people you're not supposed to be with. How do you manage God I mean, I, I know probably you've been in this for a while, so have you ever mishandled or heard of anyone mishandling one? How do you avoid mishandling the person who's supposed to be a blessing or God or any blessing? Well, most of the time, they have to be the same. Most of the persons. I know there's been people that, that are called to do certain things. Like, like for instance, the Queen of Sheba. What? She wasn't. Day or anything. But when she saw Solomon, she decided, I'll put all these things in the gifts to give to you. And Solomon said, no, I'm going to give you even more when you leave, not because I'm trying to impress you. But when you get back to where you at, I want you to be able to tell the people everything you saw was true and then some. So now the impact that she had when she went back. Is an Ethiopian eunuch that uh, was, was uh, that was sent that was sent to in the desert, and that eunuch had a version, a copy 
of that present time was said, how can I understand it? Let somebody leave you. So God translated somebody to that very person. Now, because she did that, from that period of time on, every queen brought her treasures to the king of Israel. And imagine the position a caravan come to bless. That's the kind of thing you have to do to maintain a relationship. Now, sometimes, you do things wrong, and the problem with doing things wrong is we don't like to be wrong. So if you do something wrong, you know we have a thing called, please forgive me, I'm sorry I did that. Most of the time, we have difficult going to the person and asking them to forgive me for doing something. Forgive me. Now, I've been mad for a long time. So I, I've been I'm used to saying it. I'm sorry, please forgive me. You know, I mean it that way, and, and I still love you, and those kind of things. So it's imperative that we recognize that we're not going to do everything right. When I get into a relationship, I already know. They're fallible. They're going to do and say things wrong. The issue is the intent. Do I, on purpose, try to offend you and try to mishandle you, or did I just make a mistake? Those are the things that we have to do. And then if the person is ready to say, forgive me, I should forgive me, I made a mistake. So, so what do you say to people who had God in any relationship, but they're not able to keep them for a long term? What advice can you give them how to maintain people who meant to walk with you longer that you've got to sacrifice? Well, the issue is you have to remember who you are first. And if, you're not, if you don't understand who you are now, it's difficult to be in a relationship. Because once you're presenting something, I mean, you them. If God was calling me to be in a relationship with XYZ, but I'm not walking in who God called me to be, how can I maintain this relationship? Because I'm not even who I'm supposed to be. So, so when you have people who are sabotaging relationships, you're just because of rejection or being put in positions that, uh, of not being cherished. So you don't understand how to, to operate in the relationship. You have to do. You have to begin to understand who you are first. You got to begin to say, "Well, help me to be who I'm supposed to be," and then I can be with God. So, you got to be an example uh, when it comes to husband and wife. The Bible says, "Who shall find a wife finds a good thing shall obtain favor with the Lord." So, the first issue with that is that God is saying that. The woman should already be a wife. You're looking for not a woman, you're looking for a wife. So then the second issue is, is that there has to be some favor on my life. So I see that because I have the proper wife, there's favor on my life. So it's important to recognize that we come into God relationships, there's always blessings that come from it. If you're in ungodly relationships, you, you the issue is not if you have obstacles. The life is fun. The issue is, am I blessed beyond the obstacles? Because obstacles come, God favors me. When obstacles come, I still have the grace of God. When obstacles come, He still blesses me. So if I'm in a relationship that is not a God, I'm going to be in these situations that's like, why does this still happen? Why am I never able to, to break through this? Why am I never able to do this? Why am I never able to do this? And sometimes we sever relationships. Once we do that, then you begin to see. I mean, it's, it's real clear. We know that. If you hang around people who are bad, mess up. Mess up stuff happens. If you hang around thieves and you do what thieves do, then you're going to receive the recompense of what thieves do. So you have to position yourself to be around people. You get around people who have grace on them. Get around people who have faith on them. Get around people who, who tell you the truth. Get around people who are causing you to be more than who you are, encouraging you to be something, not always putting you down, those kind of things. So it's imperative that we don't go for the flow, but that we recognize that there are people around us, and God will break people around you and help you because. Do we, how do we, do, do we have a part to play in those connections? Do we make ourselves available? Do we show up at places? 
Or do we just sit back and wait for people to walk in our lives? The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. So you still have to hear God. I, I'll give you an example. Um, when I met my wife, I was a physician and we were practicing at night. One of my band members, his girlfriend, was going to this school. And she said, Well, there's going to be a soccer tonight. And the band that we wanted to see was there. His girlfriend went to the school, didn't know any of the people, not like for any of them. So I went there and met her there. And she lived on the south side of Chicago. I live on the north side of Chicago. Uh, we were far apart, went to different schools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But God orchestrated it that once in a chance meeting wasn't changed. But I met her on that specific day, that specific time, and that's what happened. So you have to continually believe that God will orchestrate your steps. You have to continue to believe that when you're trying, sometimes God will say, I'll take a different way home. Sometimes God will say, you know, don't go in there, it's just won't be over here. There's things you have to listen to see what God is telling you. But if you are, for me, I understand, sometimes we can be stubborn. And God has to put things in your way to stop you from doing certain things. See, see after a while, I begin to recognize well, that's like I'm bumping my head against the wall. I need to stop doing this. Let me do this. So oftentimes, when you, when you pray, first of all, you do need to pray. Because when you when you begin to pray, Lord, help me, God, me, lead me, then God will begin to do that. And sometimes, you'll have to shut doors, shut things off from you so that you'll go in the direction you want you to go. But keep praying. Once you do that, God reads those prayers, and he begins to order your steps. I mean, that's, uh, that's so good. So I, I got this. This is like, this is probably a combo question. Now. How do we? So I know that people out there watch. They say, okay, you know what? I, I made some mistakes. I maybe picked the wrong job, picked the wrong relationship. I might have a living in person and had children by someone who mistake. What do you say? That, is there a way to recover? And can you speak to that as far as how how God sees that? Well, um. David made some mistakes. He made a lot of mistakes. He taught people that God didn't tell him to fight. When he came back to Ziklag, everything was gone. Mm. Everything was gone. And he was like, okay, I'm going to do this right this time. He did also a wrong. He tried to bring the uncle to come back into Uzzah's. And Uzzah died. And he said, okay, forgive me. I'm going to do the right this time. So one of the greatest kings in the history of Israel made multiple major mistakes that caused people's lives. But he repented. He said, Lord, I made this mistake. Show me how to do it. Show me how to fix it. And at first thing, then God said, you're going gonna, you're gonna to pursue it. Gonna overtake and you're gonna recover everything. Everything. And then in the midst of that going, there's guys who got weary because they just came from the battle. And they said, Well, we'll keep going, but we're gonna take stuff and they not we make stuff. He says, No, we're not doing that. So he didn't want to compound the mistake by making another mistake. So in the in the Essence of doing things wrong, don't compound mistakes. You have to go back and say, Look, I made a mistake. Forgive me for that mistake. I spent too much time doing this. I shouldn't have been doing it. Forgive me for not paying attention to what you called me to do. Forgive me for, for not being able to focus. Now, I got my attention focused on something else. So you have to be able to see our God is a loving God. So he's not wondering if we're going to make a mistake. He knows that we're going to make a mistake. But the issue is, what do we do once we make a mistake? How do we respond? Do I go back and say, Lord, forgive me? Help me uh, help me redeem what I've, I've lost? 
Help me to understand why I keep getting in relationships. Help me to understand why I keep messing things up. Help me to understand why I married the wrong person. Help me to understand why, you know, I'm in a relationship with somebody who I'm supposed to be in. Help me understand why I took this job when I'm not supposed to. Help me understand these things. And then God will begin to reveal it to you. Because so the issue is, once you realize you made a mistake, ask God to forgive you and move on. You got to do it. If you know you made a mistake, God made it clear you made a mistake. You have to do what you need to do. And then go back and say, God, forgive me. Show me what I'm supposed to do right now. So that's what you see all the individuals in the Bible did. They were like, uh, I'll give you another example. When Samuel went to find the king of Israel, he was like, oh, you know, Saul, Saul, so God said, you know, stop going on Saul. That's over. Stop going on Saul. Then he goes to Jesse's house and said, sure, but he said, no, I'm in here. Don't come out of the state of the family. I'm going to show you what it is. So if he had, he could have compounded the mistake he made because when he picked Saul, he yielded to what the people wanted to do. So it's like sometimes we're in situations where we yield to what people want us to do instead of what God tells us. He is better. Sorry. So how do we do it? Because if you grew up in a house and didn't have a bunch of discipline, and then you got a, a father figure or a father or a god father coming with discipline, and maybe you might confuse that with abuse. How do you, how do you, if, if, if it's wrong to you, if that correction is wrong to you, how do you deal with that and overcome it? Well, for sure, the Bible is clear what it says. He chases those lovers. We've got to understand that in order for us as human beings to be able to do what we're supposed to do, most people operate on impulse. Many of you may know this, but most young adults' brains are not fully developed until they're in the mid to late 20s. So you don't even have all your reasoning complete yet. So it's imperative that you do. So now, as you ask, if you've been brought up in a situation where there's chaos, those are very difficult things to overcome. Yes. But what you have to do is, once you recognize that there's chaos in you, and that you've been raised in a situation with chaos, with, without a father, or whatever the situation may be, you have to come with grips with God can rectify and deal with all. So most of the time, when we come to these situations, we try to fix it ourselves. We try to do things like we have self-help books, those kind of things. Now, I'm not telling you that there's not time for me to be counseled, because we do. But you have to come to grips with the fact that this is what happened. I like it to this. We have a GPS system on our phone. Unless you put it in where you at, it'll never be able to take you where you're going. So what we want to do when it comes to becoming who God calls us to be, we never want to acknowledge who we are. We always have this wrong assessment. Even when you take a meeting, the Bible says judge yourself. We have to get to a place. We accurately judge ourselves. Not to learn, not to know. We begin to look at ourselves and say, okay, this is what and who I am. This is my starting point. Is. God can take me to the next level. And if you don't realize, well, yeah, I was, I was brought up in a chaotic house. I was brought up with a father. The father didn't refer to me. Mother wasn't there. All these things. Yet I recognize this is what happened. And because of that, this is who I am. This is why I'm like the way. This is why I'm true. This is why I'm like. This is why I don't have a relationship. This is why I don't trust me. This is why I don't trust me. And you get those things in your head. Okay, that's why. Now I can say, okay, change that for you. Bring people around you that are going to cause you to trust them. And this is real simple. Um, back in my own history, I was a wrestling coach for a lot of years. And it came to fact that a lot of the wrestlers I had came single parent family. And I definitely understood after that encounter with Fred Evans 
that that was one of my calls to father them. And I did those things. And I recognized the problem was when the season was over for me to get out of it, I didn't want to because I enjoyed dealing with the boys. I enjoyed doing it. And I enjoyed experiencing it. I enjoyed doing all that. And I said, no, you got it. It's over. This is over for me now. So I stayed longer, but now I begin to do things because sometimes I need to be. I have to be a hundred with you. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to sell this thing. But shut it down for me. And then when we did it, I said, okay, now I see that my time is up here. I did what you called me to do. Now I'm moving on. So saying that to say, when you know that you've been brought up in these situations, when you understand that these are the reasons why you respond to what you do, you need to go to God and ask Him to help you overcome these situations. When He does, listen, we can't do it by ourselves. There's no way we can do it by ourselves. We all need Him. The Bible is real clear about working together. The Bible is real clear about these things. But we understand that I have issues. That I help do the issues. He's going to put us in different ways, bring us the things that help us be able to overcome. So I gotta go. I gotta go to these takeaways there because I know that you got a lot of input in here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, read them to you, and then hopefully you can respond to us with some wisdom here of that 48 years of relationship there, possible. I love it. And so take one point: is God ordain relationships with agree with God and His will for your life. Will and it's interesting because if it is a joy to know that you have somebody. Alongside of you, whether it's a good friend, because when you look at David's relationship with Jonathan, Jonathan saved David's life a couple mm -hmm. of times. Yes. When you look at the relationship with uh, Sarah and, and Abraham, Sarah saved Abraham's life, even though he lied and said there was a wife, he still yes. saved his life a couple of times. So it's imperative that you understand that when God begins a new ordained situation, your life is going to be a point of What about those relationships that God ordained that ain't so sweet? Like when Nathan walked up in there and had to check David about what he did, how do you how do you manage that? Because some people might be that's the devil and they didn't disagree with me. How do you how do you get to the level where you can allow people in your life? It might be God or David, it might not agree with everything. What what we see you said is how they might not agree with your mess. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a history of my problems with all the time. Say if two people agree upon everything all the time, one of them not think. Oh that's <laughs> good. So so I come to understand that I had to develop relationship with people. Trust first. Mm -hmm. I had to develop a relationship of them recognizing that I care for them and my intentions are not to harm them. If you can never get to a place where you can tell a person that something that they're doing is wrong, then their relationship is the one side of the relationship. They should be able to speak into your life good and correct in measure. You should be able to speak into their lives, blessing and corrective business. It's important because we all have blinders. And I'm fortunate enough to have someone who will speak to my blind spots, even if I don't like it. And I'm fortunate to have someone I can speak to my own blind spots, even if she don't like it, and even if I have to do it. Look at it and say, Jeremiah, please forgive me. So it's important. You gotta have it. The second takeaway is you must be open to receiving godly counsel. How do you how do you uh, open yourself up to receive godly counsel if you usually have your wall up? Well, I'm, I'm gonna share this. Most successful people who are extremely successful have difficulty receiving. Well, that is. <laughs> They view their success as a sign of knowing what to do. I got it all figured out. But what happens is, if you are truly successful, 
you have people around you who are not yes men and women. Mm. You have people who are friends to you and will tell you the truth. See, the truth is really important when it comes to being around you. You have to have people who tell you the truth. They don't you know, uh, talk to you because you're listening. They tell you the truth. So it's imperative that when you get to certain levels, you have to have people who will tell you what you're doing wrong. Because if you don't, you go off the you go off the road. You 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 get shipwrecked, and and that's a very important issue to have with David. David was a king. He had did all the great mighty exploits. Saw the king killed his thousand. He killed the general. He had all these forces. He had these wild young stuff. And then he did something stupid and killed my sheep and son. But then he needed somebody to tell him. You that man, man. You that person. And because he had developed relationship, anything because he had developed a relationship with my men, they never uh, made a mistake. And I was dealing with the consequences for their own. What are the perils of having yes men and women for him exclusively? Well, you will definitely go off the rails because no one has. I mean, I'll give you an example. I saw this, this um, video clip of a group of pastors. They were talking. And then one got offended and said such and such. And the other one got offended because he said such and such. I'm like, those two guys, they, people don't tell them when they were. Because mm-hmm. if they don't mm-hmm. agree on something, they just leave me. Mm-hmm. You got to be able to, to receive correction. No matter who it comes from. And when David was leaving, uh, he was a he was a beggar throwing stuff at him. He said, you know, he might be more than and that because I don't think you don't know. He might be the one. He was the king, you know. So there has to come a degree of humility because you got yes men around you. We we know we're found. So you know we always make mistakes. We know that we're going to make mistakes. If I have yes men around me all the time, it means that they're agreeing to my mistake. You can't have people agree with your mistake. This is, good. this is good, y'all. This is good. Takeaway three says that the enemy will always bring the spirit of offense when God the counsel his presence. Without question. Without question. See, this is the thing that, that happens. At least this is what I learned to do. When someone brings something to me that may be, how should I put it, uh, I would perceive as offensive, first thing I do is say, I'm not going to get offended because I'm going to see whether or not that is what it is. So if somebody says something to me, I'm going to tone down my action. This is not what they're saying. And then take some time, pray about it, look at it, look at the circumstances. It is or it isn't. It is, I'll, I'll say, well, I appreciate you telling me that, but I don't see how it's happening. Then if it is, I say stuff like, you know, I recognize that. So like, please forgive me, I was wrong. Help me to go from this. You know, we've got to be able to recognize that correction is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Well, like in us makes us feel like when we're being corrected, we're being rejected or not loved. What what mechanism in us is programmed to make us feel not a feeling of love, but a feeling of rejection and being hated by the person who is rendering that? Well, a lot of times it comes to our childhood. You got to understand when children have mothers and fathers in the home, they can be corrected. They might be upset for that period of time. But once that's over, they still love their parents. Now, there's got to be a balance in their lives. There's got to be a balance when it comes to understand how to treat children. And unfortunately, we don't recognize the aspect of all the things that have been placed in circumstances we've been through that cause us to think and act as we do. So what happens is, when somebody begins to do that and, and correct us, we always look at it as a 
negative. He isn't coming in I'm a football player, and I'm playing a specific position, and a coach tells me, okay, do it this way, you know, that way. 90% of the time, you don't know, listen to the coach because they're a coach and they've been there, they've done it many times. That's what they want you to do. We know that when it comes to things on that level. If I'm at a job and it's a highly dangerous job, I'm going to listen to my woman because it's been there. I don't want to be hurt or injured. For some reason, when people call stuff in particular, how much And I've been in so many council sessions running the wire when the wife would say, you know, you on his side, or the husband would say, you on her side. I said, I'm not on any other side. Just because I put a adjustment, a correction there, automatically they, they thought I was the enemy. I'm like, no, you can't live with counseling. This is what counsel is. Counsel is giving you things that you need to do right, right, and correcting the things you did wrong and eliminating. So if you come to counseling, you gotta expect me to tell you something that you don't like. But what's the A lot of people don't like it. So last thing. Uh, me and my wife, we we had some real in-depth conversations. And I said, okay, you tell me all the stuff. And I do what you do, and I'll tell you all the stuff I do. You do what I do. And we sat there patiently because we both said, we both said that I want you to understand that I love you, and I'm not going with you. I was going to ask that. How did that happen? <laughs> so we, we talked about it at first. We said, okay, we love each other. We don't supposed to be together, and we're not going. But then we began to talk about all the things that we didn't care for that the other one did, and we began to make adjustments. And correct those things. So if I subconsciously did it again, she would say, Remember when we talked about this? Okay, I'm sorry, we'll get it better next time. And, and if she did something, I said, Remember when we talked about this? Sorry, I'll we'll get it better next time. So we understood, first and foremost, we were supposed to be together and recognize that in order for us to stay together, we had to adjust things. It's like there were any other relationship, too. Whether it's son, daughter, or, or cousin, friend, mother, there's certain aspects of our relationship that have to be put up front in order for us to maintain a healthy relationship. If we don't do that, then our relationship is going to be good. That's a good segue. So, how do we, because I know that if there are good relationships, there are people in bad relationships, but because they feel like they're in a relationship, they feel like they're obligated to say, what are some of the signs that there might be, I'm not talking about marriage, maybe business, maybe you want to go find another job. Rather than, how, how do you discern whether, okay, God's trying to build my character to this job, or this relationship is going to first, or it's actually I'm in the wrong place. That's why I'm getting abused. Well, again, you have, to, you have to look at a couple. If you're in the wrong place, you need to ask, am I being damaged spiritually? If you're feeling it, you're there. Are you being damaged spiritually? Are there things that are happening that are affecting your spirit? I'm not talking about your feeling. I'm not saying, well, they said this to me, they hurt my feeling. Or, you know, they didn't respond to me like this. Are they doing things that are affecting your spirit? Secondly, it can't be predicated on fighting. Because if it's predicated on fighting, you'll be placed to do things that God is not calling you. So you gotta understand how might we call to deal with somebody on a godly level so somebody else can see wow man. Yeah. See, there's a lot of times God will take godly people and put them in hard situations so that he can Joe is a perfect example. That once he's done for example, oh, I'm not doing it. So all these people are watching him to see what he's gonna do, but he does the right thing. That's what we have to understand. Now, if you're in a, you're in a job that, that damages you spiritually, if your spirit is getting uh, inundated, if your spirit is into a place where you just feel like you need to be there, you need to do your job and you suffer. And it, again, both of the time we do jobs because we want money. Not necessarily the case. Sometimes we need to do jobs because God tells us to. 
But sometimes when you stay there, I'm even telling it might be it might be that job that's very stressful, but it might be that one person that comes to you and asks you, how oh, could you help me? And God needs to minister, I need some prayer. It might be that one person who, who needs you to be there to speak into their lives. It's like Adam and I had spoken to Paul's life when he was on the street cross. That's powerful. That's powerful because what you're saying, don't don't make decisions based on emotion. Because God will put you in situations that might not be good to your flesh, but still bring fruitful. Um, you might have prayed more than you that you did before. You might be doing other things more. And if we judge it based on that's not God, God will because my feelings are hurt. It will be jumping from church, church, God, God, marriage, marriage. But but you gotta be make sure that if it's if it's your spirit being on this night. Okay, take away from it. Take away from it. And thank you for your time, Apostle. God and damn relationships will strengthen, encourage, and confirm. Exactly. If you if you have a God and damn relationship, it, it's interesting because when you look at God and damn relationships, oftentimes they might not look like you would think they would look. Um, when we begin to look at Peter, James, and John, we look at those three guys, their personalities are way different. We look at when James and John was talking about sitting on the right hand and sitting on the left hand and all this stuff that Peter was saying, like, I, I'll never leave him to thank you. Those are the three guys. He was bringing them to the Mount of Transfiguration. He was taking them places because he saw something in them that Cause them to transform not only the church in Jerusalem, but churches in the region, and therefore beginning to recognize what God was doing. So you've you got to get to a place of recognizing those situations. I got a question to piggyback on do we need God or damn relationship, or can we make it by ourselves, Jesus? just me and Jesus? As long as I got King Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was clear about uh, the called out ones, plural, it's not the called out one. <laughs> Even the Father is the team, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even they're a team. So when we begin to think that we can do it by ourselves, I get an example. Okay, I'm going to do it by myself. That means all the funds, you got to, even if you say for instance, I get a job. Somebody got to have do that by yourself. Um, somebody had to put you in a position to make the money. You do that by yourself. Somebody had to have the bank to, for the money to go and you do that by yourself. So it's impossible for us to do it by ourselves. We all need each other. And God made it that way. When you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it didn't say one, it says apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Or the perfecting or the equipping of the thing. So even God is saying in order for us to be equipped, it takes more than one person. It takes five ministry gifts to be able to effectively mature, equip us, and perfect us. Fortunately, I'm using an example of what I used to do. When you when you're a coach, I recognize if I'm coaching my team, I can only give them what I know. But what I'm talking about the sport is an all encompassing. So if I'm ministering and preaching to people, all I can preach to them is what I know. There are people who are knowing their finance. I want you to listen to them. There are people who are knowing their service. Listen to them. There are people who are doing it in marriage council. Listen to them. What's going on? Scripture gave them to just understanding what I understand. Because we have a limited amount of knowledge. And that biblical knowledge is infinite and God is infinite. So I'm not going to allow myself to tell them, only listen to me, only listen to what I'm saying, and only do what I'm telling you. I got one last question. This is, I hope this is a good one. I, hope, I, I know you got something for me. What do you say to the person who has been hurt by a male role model? It says, I'm just telling I'm just going to stay home. I, I know I need somebody, but I'm scared to to be vulnerable. What do you say to them? Well, 
I don't know if we could only be our faith in the church. Church of church of life, church of and the COVID pandemic gave us an excuse not to be associated with church folk, pastors, people, go to the church, gave an excuse. Now I don't have to go back to life and watch But the Bible is clear, it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, forsaking ourselves, don't forsake assembling ourselves together. That it's our responsibility to be in relationships. Now, I understand that because of our situation in this country, there's a lot of women who are hurt by men. There's a lot of people who go to church and been hurt, lied to. There's a lot of uh, ungodly men and women who are uh, using people. I understand those things are happening, but just because it is happening, if there's a false that is true. So you have to get to a place of being able to, to say, I made those mistakes. Now let me let me say this to you. There are a lot of people who are can seduce you. There's a lot of people who can seduce you as a pastor or a man or a woman. You have to get to a place of not allowing your emotions again to stop you from being in the place God wants you to be or to the church God wants you to be. Man, man, God told you to be. If you let those things happen, you will never accomplish what God is going to accomplish. And that's the problem. There are a lot of people in that situation. I'm going to pray for you that you will be able to overcome hurt. Because hurt is a very real thing, but it's still in our soul and strength. Get out of the soul and strength. So I'm afraid of this spirit. That's powerful. That's powerful. This is going on for two hours because I've got another question, but I, I thank God. Or if you were saying also powerful what you were saying about you know what I took out of that is is you gotta let go of the hurt, but then holding on to hurt people to prevent you from the God ordained spouse, God ordained job, God ordained church. And so before we leave, I would like you if you could pray the prayer of salvation, but also pray for hurt. Because I don't want like, um anyone to be held back because you know you might we might have had Ishmael with in our life, my life too. And but then um, um we could be so closed up, afraid to make a mistake that we're not even ready for the ice or the promise. So if you could pray salvation and pray that over but also if you got some closing words for us about that, that'd be great too. Well what we need to do is not second to the question. Then repeat that Father in the name of Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for those things I've done. And she will forgive me for my sin. For I know that there's only one way to Christ, or one way to the Father, that's the Jesus Christ. I recognize, Father, that to accept you as your Father would have saved you, they have to believe that you are risen from the dead. But I accept you as my Lord and Savior, and I believe in Christ, you are risen from the dead. But I ask you to lead me all the days of my life in Jesus' name. I want to pray for those who've been hurt. Father, in the name of the people, like, I pray for those who've been hurt by men who, who even have been felt as though they were mistreated and that you didn't do what you said. I pray and break those things to them. So that they have. Well, you said, Father, you came to heal the broken heart. So I pray for those who, who charge the broken who've been hurt by men, who've been hurt by pastors, who've been hurt by church people. I pray, Father God, that you would lead them and open their minds and open their hearts that they would be able to receive from the true men and women of God, from those who love you with all their heart, mind, and strength, for those who, who do love you in Jesus' name. So I pray, Father, help them to see, open the eyes of their understanding that they can know the hope of their calling. Help them to realize who you call them to be and what you call them to be and how you call them to be. But bring godly relationships Godly relationship. Godly relationship where they can walk together. They can see the, the presence of the Lord. I pray that you would visit them in the night season. Visit them in a dream. That you'll be able to break through that stubbornness, that hurt, that deep hurt that prevents them from seeing and hearing their voice like you called them to do. But I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's powerful. I told Pat, I told you, Pat, you're in good hands for a month. So, 
I love you. I thank you. And look, this is your pastor, uh, Dr. Sean C. Lucas, and this is Apostle, our overseer, Ron James, saying what? Keep moving.